Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm your next chair. My name is Ivan. Uh, so let me introduce our next speaker. So it's, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ilya Raskazov. Uh, he, I'd like to tell a couple of words about him. Uh, so he was graduated uh, bachelor, master and PhD degrees uh, from Sabir Federal uh, University in Russia. Uh, excuse me, okay, what's happened? Sorry, some technical issues. Now it's working. Uh, since then, uh, he's been a postdoctoral researcher uh, in the Illinois, University of Illinois, and now he's currently working in University of Ro Rochester in the United States. So a couple of words about his main research interests. Uh, so it includes photonics, plasmonics, spectroscopy, and light matter interactions. He is also an active member of Optical uh, Society of America and serves as the editor of, uh, for a number of OSA and other journals. And finally, this thing might be very helpful for most of us. So Ilya has developed open MATLAB code for calculating near and far field electromagnetic properties of uh, multi-layer spheres called Stratify. So it's freely available. So now I think I can uh, give a online floor to Dr. Raskazov uh, for his lecture entitled Light scattering for from multi-layered spheres. You're welcome. <clears throat> hey, uh, hey everybody. Uh, thank you, Ivan or Ivan, uh, for this kind of introduction. So uh, let me try to share my screen uh, and we'll see how it works. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, it's working and Final check, does it work? Yeah, it's, it's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, first of all, uh, again, hi everybody from the uh, Rochester, New York. Uh, it's, <laughs> uh, I, I actually didn't decide is it's uh, late night or early morning on my side. It's 4 a.m. for at night. Um, so uh, for uh, uh, some time you will see me uh, in the dark background, but uh, after this uh, first lecture, uh, it will be a sunrise and yeah, it will be a little bit brighter. So um, I'm uh, from the University of Rochester, uh, from actually from the Institute of Optics. Uh, this is the birthplace of optics uh, in the United States. Uh, if you ever uh, read the book uh, Boren Wolf, uh, the principle of optics, so Emil Wolf is from here. He worked uh, at the uh, University of Rochester for, for a very long time. So uh, today we are going to talk about uh, light scattering from multi-layered spheres. Uh, and uh, thanks for Andrei Bogdanov, who uh, has prepared you to the uh, to this topic by introducing the me theory, which is actually uh, one layer of sphere, and the uh, second layer being the host medium. Uh, so, and I would really like to start. Uh, Okay. Uh, I would literally uh, like to start with the uh, some sort of motivation. Uh, why we really bother about uh, multi-layered spheres? What is um, so important and so what are their applications? And uh, to date, um, multi-layered spheres can be used in a various applications in actually in a large number of applications. For example, uh, in medicine, well, actually, do you see my uh, pointer? Yeah, is yes, it? The pointer is visible. It's visible, okay, yeah, just <laughs> a little bit of uh, technical remarks. It's not really usual for me to, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, it can be used in uh, medicine, uh, for example, uh, uh, to deal with uh, tumor cells, uh, with cancer, and so on and so forth. Uh, it can, uh, multi-layered spheres can be used for sensing. Um, 
for uh, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, uh, for fluorescence, uh, which is uh, the fundamental for uh, bioimaging. Uh, they also can be used uh, as the uh, uh, built-in block for uh, nanoscale uh, lasers, uh, for uh, enhancing uh, nonlinear processes, for example, such as uh, second harmonic generation. Uh, Multilayered spheres are really nice uh, for cloaking, for uh, constructing some kind of invisibilities cloaking. And uh, they can also be used uh, for uh, accumulating uh, solar energy uh, to harvest the energy from the uh, sun and to use it, uh, for example, to, uh, to heat or boil water uh, or uh, to enhance uh, uh, chemical reactions to speed up chemical reactions. So uh, basically, uh, I will finish uh, my presentation, my whole presentation with uh, this slide. Uh, and uh, you will uh, really uh, understand how all of these applications work and how to calculate, to estimate uh, the performance of multiple red spheres for these and uh, for uh, other different applications. Okay, so uh, actually uh, today we will have a very long session. Uh, we'll have four, uh, two lectures uh, and two practical lessons. Uh, and it's going to be six hours with me. So be prepared, it's going to be a very long time. Uh, so uh, during this session, uh, we will uh, learn a lot of things. Uh, during the lecture, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some fundamentals of light scattering for multilayer spheres, uh, how to solve this problem, uh, uh, how to get uh, some useful quantities, uh, and how to use this uh, fundamental knowledge for some practical applications mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, during the practical lessons, uh, as Ivan uh, has mentioned, uh, uh, we're going and we're try we will try to use my MATLAB, uh, develop MATLAB code uh, uh, to get some fundamental properties of multilayer spheres. Uh, we'll try to run uh, this MATLAB code and uh, we're going to find out uh, uh, the applicability of uh, different multilayered spheres for some particular applications. So uh, my today's lecture uh, will be based uh, on a couple of uh, published works, uh, rec uh, recently and not really recently published works. And uh, some works uh, have been submitted and uh, freely av available on archive. Uh, so these are these works. Uh, after this lecture, you will uh, have uh, this presentation. Uh, I believe uh, it will be distributed uh, between students uh, and yeah, just you will see them. Okay, so a couple of remarks before I start. Uh, so uh, looks like uh, you are more or less familiar with um, uh, using event rocks. So just to make sure, uh, use discuss button to ask you, uh, to ask a question. Uh, if it is really applicable, please include slide number to your question. So if I will be, uh, it will be uh, convenient for me. Uh, I'll try to address all of your questions uh, after each section. It will be a couple of breaks during the talk. Uh, and uh, if I will uh, notice some uh, really important and urgent questions, uh, I will address them immediately. So just uh, to, uh, to start and to um, uh, basically, uh, I would like to see how it works. Uh, could you please, uh, students, could you please use uh, this uh, discussion button? and um, type the answer. Who are these guys uh, shown in this photo? 
and I'm going to check it. Do you know? This is uh, so, uh, uh, <laughs> just from, from uh, Efren Serra. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see. So I, I yeah, just, uh, I, I'd like to see how, how it works. So any other uh, suggestions, guys? So I mean, you, uh, yeah, if, if I miss something, you, you, you can read, uh, yeah, if not, uh, I just, I will try to address all of this uh, question during discussions. Come on, guys, uh, you should know them. Uh, okay, we have a suggestion that there is a Donna Street lens. Maybe, maybe. Any other suggestions? Come on, wake up, wake up guys. <laughs> I would like to see some feedback just to make sure that we have live audience. Uh, probably for uh, some people may have uh, uh, lag uh, if they're using web interface of the of the app. So it's about fifty uh, se seconds of delay. So it uh, okay. your, your questions might be the answers might might be delayed. Ah, okay. I I just wanted yeah to make sure uh, to see how it works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm <laughs> Somebody does not have idea. Okay, guys. So uh, basically, uh, it was a big buzz about these two guys, especially <laughs> at the University of Rochester, because on the right, uh, as uh, uh, it was mentioned, uh, this is a Donna Strickland. On the left is a drum row. And we have, yeah, we have uh, the right... Uh, answer as well and they uh, both have worked at the University of Rochester. They are uh, our uh, former uh, graduate, uh, so Donna is our former graduate and Jerome Rowe uh, was a professor here and they uh, are uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize uh, winners uh, back in 2018 for developing um, tweezers. Oh, no, 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 not tweezers, but yeah, auto shot optical pulses. Okay, so uh, before I go, uh, I already see uh, one question. So uh, for the lasing, uh, do you also call this curious quantum dots or how large are they? So basically uh, for the lasing, uh, I'm gonna use, um, for the lasing, uh, I'm gonna use uh, the uh, active medium or quantum dots or whatever. So as long as it's spherical shape, uh, we can solve this. Uh, and it doesn't really matter how large or small are they if uh, you are uh, using the appropriate expressions for uh, the electric primitivity of the sphere. So, okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, The lecture will consist, and the outline of my lecture uh, is the follows. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm going to introduce some fundamental knowledge to you and discuss the basics of the uh, stratified medium, uh, multilayered medium uh, in general. Uh, then I will go uh, to spherical case and uh, consider multilayered spheres. Uh, there, uh, I will again uh, mention about uh, field expansions into spherical harmonics. I'm going to use a little bit different formalities other than Andrei uh, Bogdanov has mentioned, but it's, uh, it yields the same result, but uh, a little bit different equations. Uh, then uh, I'm going to uh, consider a very specific case of the single interface, which is uh, nothing but a new theory. Uh, and then I will go to multiple interfaces. Uh, after that, uh, I'm going to talk uh, so how the uh, sphere will interact with the plane wave illumination and talk about near field properties. Uh, and uh, then I will move on to dipole source. Uh, dipole emitter uh, placed near or 
near or within a multi-layer sphere. Uh, there I will provide uh, some guidelines for a general solution of this problem. And then again, talk about far field properties and near field properties. After that, uh, I will make some remark, remarks about numerical aspects uh, of all of these uh, things and stuff. Introduce a little bit more physics and discuss uh, a couple of uh, interesting and popular and uh, wide, widespread applications of multi-layer spheres. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice and uh, not uh, being very active. <laughs> it's really late at night and I'm trying my best. So uh, starting uh, with fundamentals. Uh, let us consider a very general setup of uh, a multi-layered uh, medium. So uh, not even talking about the Maxwell equations, not even talking about the electromagnetic waves. Let's consider just, just a wave, just a wave, uh, which is, uh, for, for example, from Psi, uh, like uh, you may see from the uh, Schrodinger equation. So uh, our medium uh, can, uh, if our medium consists of uh, different layers with piecewise constant properties, which means that uh, the properties of the medium is um, the uh, are the same within uh, each given particular layer. Uh, and if our wave uh, can be described with the second order scalar linear wave ordinary differential equation like this. And well, actually you may uh, immediately recognize that uh, it is applicable uh, to the electromagnetic waves and you may recognize the consequence of the Maxwell equations here. So uh, for this kind of wave, uh, the solution, the general solution can be written as follows. Uh, and it basically represents uh, in each layer, the wave uh, can be decomposed, can be represented by uh, the forward propagating wave and backward propagating wave. And these uh, two solutions, psi plus and psi minus, uh, they are considered to be linearly independent to build up the solution. Uh, here, A n and B n uh, are being the uh, amplitudes of uh, these partial waves, uh, respectively. So, <clears throat> uh, having said that, uh, at any layer, at any boundary, uh, the boundary conditions uh, are imposed and they require the continuity of uh, the wave and its first derivative. Uh, yeah. So um, this uh, boundary condition uh, yields uh, the following equations. So you take the uh, wave, uh, the solution of the uh, electromagnetic wave on the left side and uh, on the right side, and on this boundary, uh, they have to be the same. Uh, if this uh, medium is uh, multilayered for any arbitrary uh, number of layers, uh, you essentially uh, end up with uh, some initial conditions which uh, are correspond to your incident wave. For example, if uh, you just uh, set up the incident wave uh, and uh, that's it. So let me elaborate a little bit on this. Okay. So So um, basically, uh, this solution 
can be uh, these uh, boundary condition uh, can be written in matrix form, uh, just a little bit restructurized. So again, uh, this is uh, what we have on the left boundary, and this is what we have on the uh, on the left hand side and on the right hand side of the boundary. Uh, in order to translate the field from one medium to another medium, it is uh, instructive to represent uh, this uh, boundary condition, which is given in matrix form, uh, by uh, moving, uh, dividing <clears throat> left side uh, by this matrix or right side by this matrix. So uh, if you uh, are left with only uh, these amplitudes or exp uh, so-called expansion coefficients on the left sides and uh, construct some matrix uh, on the right side, which is applied to these uh, amplitudes on the right hand side uh, of the boundary uh, or vice versa, then you can uh, translate fields uh, from one boundary to another. Uh, it, imp it implies that uh, you need uh, to invert, uh, well, basically, if, if you divide uh, the right-hand side by this matrix, uh, you end up with uh, this matrix being inverted or vice versa. And uh, the trick here uh, is that uh, these metrics, or this matrix, uh, or any other metrics on uh, for this uh, stratified medium uh, can be really safely inverted. Uh, if you recall the Kramer's rule from uh, linear algebra for uh, two by two matrices. Uh, this is like a classical equation uh, from the uh, linear algebra. It's uh, nothing uh, special about this. Uh, and in the denominator, uh, you have the determinant of this matrix. So the trick here is that uh, this determinant uh, is uh, always, for our setup, is always non-zero because our uh, partial waves, uh, our uh, forward and backward propagating waves are linearly independent. So uh, if uh, you build up, so if you uh, correspond to this ABCD matrix to this ABCD matrix, you will end up uh, with uh, this Vronsky, Vronsky uh, and for linearly independent solutions, uh, it is always non-zero. It means that uh, these inverse matrix uh, can always be found, which in turn means that I can always translate fields from uh, one boundary to another boundary uh, in any way. Okay, so, uh, and again, uh, these matrices are always invertible, which again means that uh, we can always find the uh, amplitude of uh, forward and backward propagating waves in any layer. So having said that, uh, it implies that um, for, uh, let me just go back. So uh, I didn't really uh, consider it Maxwell equations here. Uh, it's just uh, the sum wave, which uh, is described by a second order scalar linear wave or linear differential equation. Uh, and as long as this uh, linear uh, differential equation is applicable, 
I can use this formalism. And basically, uh, it is always described by two by two matrix, two by two transfer matrix. Uh, and there is no need uh, to use uh, any larger matrices, which means that uh, for stratified medium, uh, the use of two by two matrices is expected intrinsic so it's 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 like by the nature and optimal if you again can identify uh, ordinary differential equation so it means that uh, this formalism uh, can be used for uh, different medium and the classic example and standard examples of, the, of these uh, media are uh, one dimensional. These are uh, thin uh, layers, uh, just planar medium. For two dimensional case, uh, that is the uh, wires uh, or infinite cylinders. And for three dimensional case, uh, these are spheres. And now uh, moving to Maxwell equations and moving to uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, field propagation in any of this medium, uh, we can state, uh, uh, we can see that uh, if our field can be expanded in uh, plane waves, or uh, as you have uh, seen from the previous lecture for uh, spherical waves, or actually it can be also expanded into cylindrical waves. Uh, you can always use this uh, two by two transfer uh, matrix methods uh, for any of these cases, as long as you uh, can appropriately expand your electromagnetic field. Uh, for one dimensional case, again, these are simply plane waves. For two dimensional case, these are cylindrical Bessel functions, uh, which is pretty much are almost the same as spherical Bessel functions. And for three dimensional case, there are spherical Bessel functions. So uh, the can and the problem considered uh, before for a general setup uh, for any, like for a general wave, uh, translates uh, to the case of the uh, Maxwell equations uh, in that sense that uh, wave and its derivative is nothing but the uh, tangential components of the electric and magnetic fields. And uh, notice that, uh, again, the uh, derivative of this uh, our wave uh, is nothing but the magnetic uh, component of the electromagnetic field. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and here I would like to refer to uh, very famous uh, Abelis solutions for stratified medium with the plain, uh, plain waves, thin films. Uh, discussed in uh, these references. For two-dimensional case, uh, there is not really so much literature about this, and for three-dimensional case, uh, which are multi spheres, uh, we're going to discuss right now. So uh, here I would like to uh, look on the, que uh, on the questions. Okay, so actually, uh, no questions here. Uh, so let me move on then. So <clears throat> for uh, speaking about, again, multilayered spheres. Uh, so our general setup will be as follows. Uh, we'll consider the uh, multilayered sphere uh, 
are embedded in the host medium, in some, in some medium. Uh, each uh, uh, of the layer uh, of the multi-layered sphere uh, will be described by the uh, dielectric permittivity and uh, magnetic permeability. It's a general case. Uh, uh, I'm not going to be limited with purely uh, electric, uh, uh, purely dielectric material. Uh, it's going to be uh, very general. Uh, each uh, layer uh, uh, is characterized by the uh, outer uh, radius, like for uh, outer radius, yeah. And uh, I will consider uh, two different uh, excitations uh, of the multilayered sphere. It's going to be either the plane wave or uh, the uh, dipole emitter. And uh, in general, I uh, will consider the dipole emitter uh, located anywhere, outside of the sphere or inside the sphere, doesn't matter. Uh, so uh, also uh, I will refer to any layer uh, of the sphere. Uh, sometimes I will refer uh, to this as to the shell. And the first layer uh, is usually uh, called as core. Uh, and that's it. So, uh, this actually, uh, just a brief question, Ivan, is the quality of the video is okay? Uh, so, there are some concerns. Uh, yes, it's, it's okay. Yeah, okay, so you can see, you can read everything, yeah, it's... Yeah, for, for me, it's absolutely visible. Okay, okay, fine, it's just some concerns about this. Okay, okay, thanks. So, uh, recalling again uh, the Maxwell equations, just, just to put in, uh, them, there, uh, them here and uh, to keep them in mind, and to remind you that uh, in uh, our case, we'll consider uh, only isotropic spheres, which means that the uh, epsilon and mu are going to be scalars. Uh, basically, this formalism can be uh, generalized to uh, any epsilon and any mu, like uh, it can be tensors, it can be an isotropic, uh, but the uh, overall solution will be uh, pretty much uh, difficult and cumbersome uh, and will require uh, a lot of mathematics. So uh, we, we are apparently going to skip this and uh, limit uh, our uh, discussion just only to the scalars. So, uh, as uh, in the previous lecture uh, for the me theory, uh, uh, I'm going to use the uh, expansion of the fields into the uh, spherical harmonics. Uh, but I'm going to write uh, uh, this in a little bit different manner. So, uh, I'm going to find my solution of the Maxwell equations. In the, uh, in the following form. So here F are going to be our, my uh, multipoles, uh, where, uh, yeah, uh, okay, I'm just going a little bit. Uh, and uh, Ys uh, are going to be my uh, vector spherical harmonics, which I will discuss on the next slide. So uh, my multipoles uh, are actually nothing but the uh, combination of the uh, spherical harmonics uh, and uh, appropriate uh, Bessel functions, where f is going to be a spherical Bessel function, either uh, j or h. Uh, again, uh, I will uh, elaborate this uh, a little bit uh, on the next slides. And um, my subscripts uh, will be M for magnetic modes, or in other words, uh, transverse electric. And E is going to be for electric modes or transverse magnetic. Uh, also, uh, K is the wave vector. R is just the, uh, my uh, radial coordinate. Uh, Subscript n will be uh, described uh, by uh, will be referred to the number of sh uh, to the number of the shell, and uh, L capital is the composite angular momentum index. 
and uh, L and M uh, should be familiar from the previous lectures. Uh, this, uh, yeah. And also, uh, it should be also familiar to you as well, just to remind you that uh, these uh, multiples are normalized uh, to satisfy uh, these relations. And, okay. So, uh, vector spherical harmonics uh, are, uh, I will write them uh, in this manner, which is basically uh, the same as uh, um, was provided by, uh, again, Andrei Bogdanov. Uh, and here, a uh, couple of remarks I would like to make. So, um, these uh, spherical harmonics are magnetic, longitudinal, and electric. Uh, longitudinal means that it only has uh, the radial components in spherical, uh, in spherical bases. And these uh, are nothing but uh, tangential, uh, tangential components of uh, my multiples, uh, which you can observe uh, here. Uh, and just to remind you that uh, here we have uh, Lejeune polynomials, which are given by uh, this relation. Uh, it's just for the sake of, uh, to remind you, uh, because as far as I understand, uh, all of this has been discussed uh, in the previous lecture. Okay, so uh, here's the thing. Uh, why uh, we have you? Uh, we are using the uh, such representation of the uh, multiples of our solution of the Maxwell equation. Uh, in order to connect uh, this problem uh, to previously consider it at the very beginning for a general solution uh, for the uh, multilayered medium. Uh, I'm going to use uh, this representation where f are nothing but, again, Bessel functions, which uh, will take form of j, uh, which corresponds to incoming, uh, incoming wave, uh, incoming in terms of uh, to the center of the coordinates. <clears throat> and if my multiple will contain this uh, incoming component, I'm going to label it like J capital. If my uh, multiple in multiple decomposition uh, will have the uh, outgoing wave, outgoing means that it goes far away from the center of the coordinates. Uh, I'm gonna label my uh, multiple as H capital, and this is outgoing wave. Essentially, uh, this problem again can be uh, written, uh, can be constructed uh, for a spherical case like this, where uh, again, a and B, uh, I'm gonna call the amplitudes or expansions of my fields in any layer. And A is going to be to correspond to the uh, incoming solution, incoming, and B to the outgoing. In such a way, uh, I can write down any field, electric, and magnetic fields in uh, any layer uh, in the following manner. So for, oh, it's going to be a little bit difficult. So uh, electric fields uh, uh, 
with the uh, electric polarization uh, will consist uh, simply uh, by these two contributions. Oh, sorry, uh, by these two contributions. Uh, the fields incoming and the fields outgoing. And essentially uh, the very same for electric field for magnetic components and for mag uh, magnetic polarization and for magnetic fields. Uh, here is a little bit difficult. Uh, please don't be confused with the magnetic field. It will have only one subscript and the uh, multiple, outgoing multiple, uh, will have two subscripts. And uh, there is uh, the subscript L uh, will distinguish the multiple from the uh, magnetic field. So again, uh, in any layer, in any layer of the multilayered sphere, the field uh, can be decomposed into, to comp uh, into components which goes to the center of the sphere and the component which goes outside of the sphere, uh, and uh, which is going to inside. Uh, I'm gonna uh, call J incoming field, which is described by this and this multiples, where in place of F, I'm going to use the uh, this spherical vessel function. And uh, the rest of the stuff should be very much familiar. So it's going to be like uh, spherical harmonics. And just to refer uh, to the, again, previous lecture, just to remind you that uh, these notation, like N and M, are uh, from Bruin Huffman, uh, which correspond to the vector spherical harmonics. Uh, we will give you very much the same results. But uh, this solution uh, is given, uh, just provided in a different notation. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> uh, having said that, it just uh, to remind you that uh, we had this, uh, let's consider uh, only one uh, boundary and constructs uh, the uh, boundary condition uh, uh, which uh, the electric and magnetic fields uh, uh, should have uh, continuous tangential components. That's pretty much easy. So uh, incoming and the outgoing wave uh, will have the following tangential components. So look here, uh, electric field uh, have uh, ingoing, uh, ingoing and outcoming components. Ingoing components uh, J multiple uh, is written like this. And basically this is tangential component, as I mentioned before. So vector spherical magnetic uh, vector uh, spherical harmonic has only tangential component in spherical coordinates. So uh, it basically goes here. So J parallel, uh, parallel because this is tangential uh, and J because here we use the uh, spherical vessel function. So, um, like this. So in such a way you can construct uh, the outgoing solution uh, for uh, the electric field like this and uh, for magnetic fields in a very similar manner. Check. Yeah, so for magnetic modes, uh, everything can be constructed uh, in this, uh, so boundary condition can be constructed uh, in this 
equations. Which are then again uh, can be written in a matrix form. If you see this, uh, you could so uh, no. Uh, actually, I would like to 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 take it back and to return. So <clears throat> I have introduced uh, yet another notation uh, U and W. This is uh, the product of the uh, Bessel functions uh, to the uh, radial uh, to the radius uh, to the uh, radial component. Uh, yeah. All of these things uh, can be written uh, in the matrix form, uh, where I have uh, for simplicity again used uh, the uh, just just the uh, simple labeling from one to two for any layer, basically from any layer, from first layer to the second layer, uh, and. you can again recognize uh, the same uh, transfer matrix form uh, as we have discussed at the very beginning, but uh, our amplitudes of our fields are now uh, are explicitly given on using the Bessel functions. And again, uh, in any other way, uh, this matrix or this matrix can be uh, safely inverted. Because again, the uh, Vronskian is generally non-zero. And for Bessel functions, uh, we actually know uh, the ready expression for this. If you consult uh, with the uh, mathematical uh, books, uh, it's not so complicated to find the expressions for this Fronsky. Uh, it means that uh, we can safely translate the fields from one medium, uh, from one layer to another layer, as long as we know the expansion coefficients uh, for the fields in one layer or another layer. Uh, so explicitly, uh, it is given like this. If I would go from uh, the layer number two to the layer number one, uh, I'm gonna use, uh, I can uh, write down something like this. So again, returning here, uh, I'm inverting this. So. I'm inverting this matrix, multiplying by this matrix. Inversion of this matrix yields the um, one divided by Vronskian, and just simply restructurizing of this matrix in a little bit different manner. Uh, so this is the Vronskian. Uh, this is again yet a little bit different uh, differently uh, written to a uh, product of two matrices. And if I collect everything together, which stands before the uh, expansion coefficients in the second layer, uh, I'm gonna call this uh, transfer matrix. I put minus here because it translates uh, the fields from the higher layer to the lower layer. So it's kind of, we are going down from the second layer to the first layer. And uh, if you repeat this procedure, uh, basically uh, if you uh, now divide uh, all of your stuff by this matrix, uh, you can end up with the, with the following expression. And these transfer matrix uh, translates fields from
from the uh, lower layer, from the lower shell to the higher shell, from one to two. So essentially, uh, everything has been uh, provided for magnetic polarization uh, or transfer, uh, or in other words, transfer transfers electric. Uh, and you can repeat all of this stuff uh, by uh, for electric and essentially um, end up with the more or less similar uh, solution, uh, which is will be a little bit different. Uh, before I provide you an explicit expressions for all of these transfer matrices, uh, it is instructive to recall that uh, the Bessel functions, which I have introduced here, here. their uh, derivatives uh, are very much similar like uh, the other formulation of uh, Riccati Bessel functions. So, and uh, you can immediately recall this uh, psi and uh, zeta uh, from the, again, previous lecture. Uh, I'm just providing this uh, to make more or less consistency with the uh, previous, uh, with more or less common formulation of the uh, light sketching problem uh, from spheres. So uh, these are uh, transfer matrices. Um, explicitly given for uh, magnetic, electric, again, magnetic and electric uh, polarizations uh, for going uh, from higher layers to lower layers or from uh, lower layers to higher layers. So uh, backwards and forwards. Uh, this formulation is given uh, in uh, size parameters, uh, again introduced in previous lectures, and uh, normalized refractive indices. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm not going to use uh, a lot of uh, refractive index uh, in my lecture, so I'm just using uh, this uh, symbol ERA. It's not really common for refractive index. Uh, and uh, this is normalized uh, magnetic permeability. Okay, so I would like to uh, stop here and check the questions. Okay. So uh, I see that the, uh, what is the difference between EE and EM? Yeah, again, so uh, electric, electric fields uh, can be given uh, for two different uh, polarizations. Transverse magnetic, which is in other words, electric polarization or transverse electric, which is in other words, magnetic polarization. Uh, they are orthogonal. Uh, and that's why uh, I'm using these uh, two different orthogonal uh, decompositions and I'm using these uh, two different channels to describe the uh, overall fields in any given layer. There is also another question uh, from Maxim Eric Alexander Burgess. Yes. Uh, yeah, do, uh, do you mean transverse electric by magnetic polarization? Yes, yes. Uh, it's, it's more or less standard. Uh, it's, it's a little bit confusing, but this is a standard uh, uh, terminology. Uh, okay, okay. I think I also have one small question. So uh, how does the T-matrix uh, is connected to the knee scattering coefficients? It, it looks like uh, 
if I, if I take the norm of the T matrix, uh, I will get something like uh, AL, like the scattering coefficients from the previous lecture. Yes. So basically, yeah, uh, if you, uh, uh, that, that's actually, uh, I have considered a very simple uh, scenario from one to two. Uh, if uh, that is going to be uh, a sphere with index one, and if the host medium will be with index two, and if you write down uh, explicitly uh, and just put the numbers like one and two, uh, you end up with the uh, coefficients. Uh, and the direct uh, correspondence to the coefficients uh, will be given just a little bit later in one of the slides. <clears throat> so uh, essentially, uh, to understand this problem uh, more, well, not really to understand, just to formulate this problem in a more interesting manner, uh, we introduce yet another transfer matrices, uh, which we call composite transfer matrices, which uh, are nothing but the products of uh, our uh, plus transfer matrices or minus transfer matrices, which uh, like transfer uh, fields from uh, the uh, core to the end to the to some nth shell, or transfer uh, fields uh, from the medium to the nth shell. So again, uh, we introduce in the composite transfer matrices. There is a product of uh, matrices uh, introduced on the previous slide. And these matrices are just transferring uh, fields from neighboring layers, each given matrix. While the composite uh, transfer matrix translates fields from sphere core to any given nth shell like this. Uh, so if I have the fields in the core, I multiply it uh, by a transfer matrix, composite transfer matrix, and translate field to any given nth shell. Uh, and the same thing to the uh, lowering, uh, lowering composite transfer matrix, which translates field uh, from the outside of the sphere and plus one, uh, uh, in my notation, uh, it means that this is the host medium. This is the last one layer, which is the host medium. Uh, it translates fields from the host medium to any given end shell. Oh. Excuse me, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, there was another question, I think, concerning the previous part. Uh, so what does, it, uh, what does it matter what type of polarization? Because from my opinion, uh, Georgi Irmalai asking, uh, in sphere that we do not distinguish S and P polarization as a result of transition should not influence the result. Um, yeah, I see, so just give me a second. Well, uh, probably uh, Georgi, uh, you're talking about the polarization of the incident fields. Uh, while we are talking about the general solution in the fields uh, in any uh, in any uh, within any layer, so in any case, uh, the fields are decomposed into orthogonal components. Again, transverse electric and transverse magnetic, and there is no other way to do this. Uh, and okay, it's. Just that's it. So, uh, okay, just let me move on. Uh, so, composite transfer matrices they translate fields from, uh, for example, from core again, to the any, any layer, and from the host medium, 
to uh, any shell. Having said that, uh, we know how to relate uh, the fields between uh, any layers. Uh, yeah, so we can uh, safely uh, translate any fields from any layer to any other layer. Uh, now, uh, for a general case, if we have uh, n plus one shells, we'll have n boundaries, which basically imply uh, two n equations uh, for electric and for, mag for magnetic fields, uh, which then uh, will end up uh, in two multiplied by n plus one expansion coefficients. So we can see that uh, the uh, expansion, uh, there are more expansion coefficients than our uh, boundaries and our equations that relate boundaries and uh, more than boundary conditions. So to solve this problem uh, unambiguously, uh, we need to set uh, two boundary conditions to find uh, any fields in uh, any layer. And let me talk about these boundary conditions. So the most important uh, boundary condition is the regularity condition. So uh, if we uh, consider the uh, illumination from the outside, uh, which means that uh, there is no source in the core of your multilayered sphere, uh, it implies that uh, there are no outgoing waves from the core, from the very second layer there is no outgoing fields, which means that the uh, expansion coefficient, uh, which, correspond, uh, which basically represent the amplitude of the outgoing wave uh, in the first layer should be zero. Uh, it, it is basically very interesting and uh, very important because if you consider any source, uh, whatever, plane wave, uh, dipole source, uh, vessel beam, uh, I don't know, Gauss beam, uh, uh, which uh, fall, which impinge uh, on your sphere uh, from the outside. Uh, you can explicitly, again, using the uh, composite transfer matrices, uh, you can relate the fields from outside. Uh, I'm actually uh, going to use, uh, for the sake of compactness, a little bit different notation for the uh, expansion coefficients uh, from the host medium, uh, field, field in the host medium. Uh, so they're related uh, to the uh, fields in the core on using these um, composite transfer metrics. Here I have explicitly uh, wrote uh, these composite transfer metrics, metrics uh, by its elements. So again, regularity condition implies that uh, in sphere core, there is zero outgoing wave. All the, all the waves are going inside the core. So, inside the core. Uh, it is related via the uh, transfer matrix uh, to the uh, field outside of the sphere in the following manner. So, the interesting fact about this that uh, the very uh, regularity condition uh, determines 
the ratio of the expansion coefficients from the outside of your sphere unambiguously for any source which falls on your sphere from the outside. Uh, if you really solve this, uh, it's, 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 very, it's very easy to show uh, that uh, if you write down that C equals T11 multiplied by APL and D equals T21 multiplied by APL. And if you divide DPL by CPL, uh, you will, uh, APL will vanish uh, and you will end up with T21 and T11. And I will yet another introduce this uh, yet one more notation, uh, this one. And now it relates to the uh, AL and BL from the Boren Hoffman book and from the uh, previous um, lecture. So that is actually the, uh, the answer to, to your question, uh, how the feel, uh, how it relates to the uh, me theory in a very, uh, in this manner. So essentially uh, one more remark uh, to be done here is that uh, multi-layered sphere uh, can be effectively treated as a homogeneous sphere uh, as long as the uh, source uh, is outside of the sphere. Where plane wave dipole, uh, dipole uh, source uh, are outside of the sphere. And uh, expansion coefficients, uh, which are known from me theory for homogeneous sphere, uh, are related uh, to the transfer matrices again as follows. And the point here is that uh, this composite transfer matrix uh, does not depend uh, does not depend on the illumination. It only depends on the configuration of your sphere. So by, by the configuration, I mean uh, the, uh, uh, how many layers do you have? Uh, what are the radiuses uh, of this sphere? What are the refractive indices uh, of each layer? Uh, and so on and so forth. So if you again recall that the composite transfer matrix uh, is nothing but the products of the uh, transfer matrices uh, that uh, transfer fields from one field to an, uh, from one layer to another layer. And recall the uh, definitions from for uh, these transfer matrices. You could see that these are nothing but the combinations of the Bessel functions. Just Riccati Bessel, uh, yeah, uh, and these Bessel functions are the functions of the uh, size parameters and refractive indices and permeabilities, permittivities of the uh, of your sphere. And here we don't have the source. We don't have the uh, any illumination here. This is intrinsic property of your multilayered sphere. This is very important. Uh, and again, uh, so we have transfer matrices, we multiply these transfer matrices uh, to this relation. Uh, and uh, this composite transfer matrix allows us to consider multi-layered sphere as a homogeneous sphere. Uh, and then we simply set up the boundary, condi uh, the regularity condition which implies that uh, there is no outgoing wave in the sphere core in the first layer because there is no source in the first layer. Uh, and then uh, we define the, uh, we can find the uh, ratio of the expansion coefficients from the outside. And then, uh, and all of this, and end up with the uh, expressions uh, for the me theory, 
like for a homogeneous sphere. So it's very interesting that uh, this simple regularity condition uh, can provide uh, can provide you such a lot of information about the sphere uh, and uh, very much simplify uh, the solution uh, of this problem. Uh, so, but that is only one boundary con uh, boundary condition. We need to set up something else. Uh, as I mentioned before, we need two boundary conditions. So this is the only one. The second one uh, will be uh, apparently uh, to define the fields. We need the source, uh, and it is again very uh, pretty much straightforward. So if you uh, had the source outside of the sphere, uh, and you know the uh, uh, the expansion of the electric fields of your source in spherical coordinate, coordinates, uh, and you can pretty much easily, well, not too easily, but you can find the expansion of any fields uh, in spherical harmonics. Uh, it just only uh, depends on how difficult it will be. Uh, so from outside of the sphere, you can really find this expansion, uh, expand any field in spherical harmonics. Uh, and then that, that will be your boundary condition. So if you have the source outside of the sphere, uh, then you can write down the uh, expansion uh, of this field. Uh, and this, that is your second boundary condition. And then you can find the, uh, and then you can translate from uh, one layer to another uh, pretty much easily. Uh, if your source is located inside a sphere uh, and uh, it actually corresponds to the, uh, for example, dipole emitter, dipole source, which will be considered a little bit later in my lecture. Uh, then you simply set up the uh, expansion, so there is no source outside, and you set up this boundary condition to zero. And again, you can find all the fields. But uh, for the dipole source, it will be a little bit, a little bit more involved, uh, and again, I, I will consider it a little bit later. So. Uh, to briefly summarize, uh, <clears throat> again, uh, you can translate field from uh, any layer to another, uh, from, from any layer between each other. Uh, if you have uh, n plus one shells, uh, uh, okay, whatever. So if you have, uh, n plus one shells, you will have, n, well, uh, less than one boundaries, just n boundaries. Uh, for each boundary, you will have uh, two by n equations uh, for ingoing and outgoing waves. Uh, and expansion coefficients for each shell is just two multiplied n plus one. So, you have two n by n equations, it's not sufficient to find two multiplied by n plus one uh, unknowns. It means that you need to set up two more equations. You need to introduce two more equations. And one equation is usually uh, introduced to the regular, uh, it corresponds to the regular condition. And the other equation is, uh, well, it corresponds to your source. Once set, uh, you can find every field, any fields uh, in the any layer, and you're essentially done. Uh, okay, so just to remind you, uh, we have uh, Transform it. Uh, we have uh, introduced uh, yet another uh, 
transfer matrix, which corresponds to the uh, mi coefficients. And uh, a little bit of remark uh, has to be done here. Uh, I would like to recall uh, the classic scattering theory, which is uh, not really usually used by uh, light scattering community, well, to the best of my knowledge. So, here it is important to introduce the uh, definition of the S matrix, scattering matrix. Uh, which importance uh, will be highlighted a little bit later. So, T matrix introduced on the previous slide, uh, it, rela it relates the incident fields given by J to the outgoing wave, while scattering matrix, it relates the incoming spherical wave to the outgoing spherical wave, to the scattered spherical wave. Uh, and here uh, again, these are Bessel functions uh, and this is not Bessel function, this is uh, again a general uh, symbol to denote the wave, general wave. So recalling the uh, definitions of the uh, Hankel functions, you can uh, relate uh, the transfer matrix and scattering matrix. And here the I denotes the unity tensor, just the one. So the question here is, uh, why even bother uh, about introducing yet uh, another uh, scattering matrices, another uh, matrices, matrices, matrices? And actually, before I uh, answer this question, I would like to do we have any questions pending? Actually, one question uh, about the lowering and raising transfer matrices. Uh, yes, yeah, I can. Uh, from Uh, yes, generally yes. So uh, we're moving uh, our fields uh, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> the answer is the answer is uh, simply yes. Uh, oh, these equations are geometry independent. Okay, uh, Deepak, I would like you to elaborate on your question a little bit. Which equations uh, are geometry independent? I'm going to check it a little bit later. Uh, and so, okay, and this is it. <clears throat> so, scattering metrics. Why even bother about scattering metrics? Because Scattering matrix, uh, which gives you the relation between uh, incoming wave and outgoing wave, uh, can be very much neatly uh, decomposed, factorized uh, on using this relation, which is called virus. I don't know. I don't know actually how to pronounce this, but the, uh, this is uh, virus truss factorization. So the very interesting thing about the, uh, uh, this relation 
uh, be, uh, because it can provide you the whole picture of your scheduling process as long as the again incident field is outside of your sphere because given that uh, factorization uh, just remind you that p means the product uh, you can find the poles and zeros of your scheduling metrics and if you can find them you can find uh, any resonances and uh, you can see any features uh, of your scheduling process from your multi-layered sphere. Actually, it also applies to homogeneous sphere, as we can see. Uh, and here, omegas, these omegas uh, are eigenfrequencies. Uh, they are generally complex uh, and consist of real parts and imaginary parts. Uh, and in a complex uh, frequency plane, and it should be more or less familiar to you, uh, real frequency corresponds to position of your resonance. Uh, and imaginary parts, uh, well, basically inverse imaginary parts, corresponds to the lifetime of your resonance. And just imaginary parts uh, is a length width uh, at half maximum. And yet again, the quality factor of this thing uh, can be uh, write down like this uh, real part divided by uh, two imaginary parts. Uh, here I would like to refer uh, to these uh, two papers, uh, very much interesting papers about this topic to get a little bit more insights about all of this stuff. So again, S metrics. If you uh, S metrics uh, can uh, well provide you means uh, provide you means to find the poles and zeros, uh, which are being mapped uh, on the complex omega plane. Uh, can give you the understanding of the light scattering processes. For example, uh, in, a diff uh, in a Hermitian system, under Her Hermitian system, it means that uh, this is a lossy system, no gain. There is no gain here. Um, they correspond simply to the resonances just me resonances, as discussed in the previous lecture. If at some point your pole and zero, your pole and zero uh, coalesce, they uh, form bound states in continuum. For non hermitian systems where you have uh, a gain, so where one of the layer uh, of your multi-layered sphere is uh, optically active, uh, it, has, it has some gain, uh, you can map uh, the lasing regimes. Uh, and this is more or less uh, simple examples. For other examples, and again, uh, for more comprehensive uh, discussion of these uh, S matrices, I would like to refer to these uh, references. And here, uh, in terms of these uh, S... Excuse me, uh, I suggest we will uh, make a short break in, in five or... Six minutes. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, I'm gonna finish the slides. Uh, yeah, okay, and uh, in five minutes we'll make a break. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, on using these transfer matrices and uh, sketching matrices, uh, the 
scattering efficiency, the absorption, of, uh, well, scattering cross-section, absorption cross-section, and extinction cross-section can be uh, formulated. And uh, in fact, uh, write down in a little bit different manner compared to the previously introduced uh, equations uh, for homogeneous field. Uh, again, they are very much the same, but written down in terms of uh, transfer matrix and S matrix. So, and now, uh, scattering cross-section can be understood uh, very much straightforwardly because transfer matrix translates incident field to scattered field. That's it. And uh, under summation here, th that is the contribution of each channel, either electric or magnetic. So uh, if uh, I recall, if, if you recall the uh, previous lecture, that uh, it was uh, A squared plus B squared. Uh, and I write down here uh, A and B separately in a more common way. Uh, if you write down the absorption, it is pretty much uh, straightforwardly formulated in terms of S matrix. Uh, if you recall that S matrix um, translates uh, or describes uh, outgoing fields, and the absorption can be understood that it is everything minus outgoing fields which is basically uh, the amount of the absorbed energy. And uh, finally, uh, the extinction is defined as the uh, scattering and absorption altogether. So if you sum up this contribution with this contribution, uh, you will get this one. And if you uh, sum up this contribution plus this contribution, you will end up with something like this. Um, so, and finally, before, yeah, before the break, uh, so uh, Jones matrix, uh, if you would like to estimate the far field properties uh, of your multilayered spheres, again, uh, explicitly, so you likely recall this slide from the previous lecture and this picture from the previous lecture from Andrei Bogdanov. I just uh, grabbed this uh, to remind you a little bit. Uh, so the sketching process uh, can be described like this, pretty much familiar equation uh, where uh, these uh, elements are strictly zero. Uh, so explicitly, if you write down explicitly as parallel as perpendicular, you end up with something like this, where again, these are T matrices, transfer matrices. And uh, again, you can uh, pretty much explicitly uh, find out the uh, differential cross-section. So the thing here is again that uh, we are using uh, these transfer matrix, which are nothing but make efficiency, which are nothing but the relation of the elements of the composite transfer matrix, which are nothing but the product of the uh, transfer matrices, which are nothing but the simple combination of the Bessel functions, which are nothing but the characteristic uh, functions of the, your uh, sphere geometry. So again, uh, if you go back here, these transfer matrices, uh, are intrinsic to your multilayered sphere. And as long as you know this transfer matrix, uh, everything, every characteristic of the far field, irrespective of your source, as long as, it's, as it is outside of your sphere. So every character, fundamental characteristics can be straightforwardly found. And 
before the short break, uh, this is actually the uh, summary of this section uh, for transfer metrics for multilayered spheres. So important feature is that, again, transfer metrics is universal for uh, any dimensional, well, 1D, 2D, and 3D stratified medium, thin films, cylinders, spheres. Uh, as long as you uh, can uh, write down the exp uh, expansion of your electromagnetic fields within any medium, uh, you can compose transfer matrices using boundary conditions uh, and solve this problem. And for multilayered spheres, well, not really for multilayered spheres, for again, for any other medium, uh, composite two by two metrics, composite metrics, uh, for, play, uh, for illumination from the outside of your medium, provides you a complete description of the scattering process with any sphere, with any arbitrary number of shells, uh, as long as we are working in our approximation, which uh, means that uh, this, uh, our multilayer sphere is Every layer of our multilayer sphere is isotropic. Uh, it's, it is very uh, interesting that you can get the complete picture of your scattering process just using uh, two by two metrics, irrespective of how complicated your sphere is, how many layers it has. You end up with a very much limited uh, characteristic, very much compact, which provides you a complete description uh, as long as it's, uh, this matrix is appropriately combined with uh, other physical parameters. Okay, so that's probably it for this section. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's start, uh, well, Let's have a short break in 20 minutes and start uh, and in 20 minutes uh, we'll start and if you will have some questions uh, I will start with answering some questions. Okay, I think we have for about 15 minutes uh, break. Okay, uh, so uh, okay, so we start at what time? Well, actually, uh, the, we, we can start uh, the next part at one o'clock. So we're in one o'clock. Okay. Yeah. So now we have a, we can have a break. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, guys. Yeah. See. Ya. Hello. Hey, hey. It's almost sunrise. <laughs> well, actually, it was 20 minutes before, according to the schedule. Okay. Okay, see, there are not so many questions right now. So, actually, uh, can we start? Yeah. Yeah, we, we can start. Yes. Okay, so uh, basically I would like to just very, very much briefly again return to the basics uh, before I move on, because uh, I feel uh, I did it not really good. Uh, so electromagnetic fields in spherical coordinates can be given uh, on using multiples, multiple decomposition which is nothing but the uh, combination of Bessel functions, F, uh, and vector spherical harmonics in a spherical case. So here in this notation, uh, we're using F 
uh, this is like in general, which can be either J, this is a spherical basal function, spherical basal function, which characterizes the field incoming to the center of the sphere, and uh, Hankel function, which characterizes the field outgoing from the sphere. Uh, to do so, we can expand all the fields within any layer uh, on using the uh, uh, expansion coefficients, which are nothing but the amplitudes of each of these components, uh, incoming and outgoing, and for any polarization in any layer, for any polarization, incoming and outgoing fields in any layer. Uh, on using the above multiples. Then, uh, recalling that electromagnetic fields uh, have uh, uh, continuous tangential components when moving from one boundary to another boundary. And then uh, collecting these uh, tangential components, for example, for magnetic fields, uh, or the, for magnetic polarization, uh, what you do? Uh, is for electric fields. You see J uh, and H. J is nothing but J Bessel function here and uh, J Bessel function here and spectrospherical harmonic. For uh, outgoing fields, tangential component for electric field is going to be the same, but on using H, Hankel function here. H uh, and uh, again vector spherical harmonic magnetic tangential. For magnetic fields, magnetic polarization, uh, you do pretty much the same. So you you find uh, for uh, you see here, this is the uh, J again multiple J. You find J E L. You find it here. It should be J. J uh, should go for Bessel functions F F here. And here we only use the uh, electric vector spherical harmonic because it is, this is the only tangential component. If you recall the uh, definition of the uh, longitudinal uh, vector spherical harmonic, you will see that this is a normal. Uh, and uh, so J, 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 J here. And pretty much the same for uh, outgoing fields. H, H, you collect this guy. And then explicitly for a boundary condition from left and right layer, number one and number two, you collect these uh, coefficients, you put uh, this j here, and you see that you end up with a multiplied by j, uh, and we have denoted j by using this uh, relation. Uh, we suppress the uh, vector spherical harmonics because um, they are the same, uh, they are R dependent. And since we're considering only the case on the one boundary between one and two, uh, the R will be very much the same. So we just suppress all the uh, vector spherical harmonics. And we can safely write down the boundary equation, uh, boundary condition for the electric fields, magnetic, uh, magnetic polarization on the first medium should equal the second medium on the boundary. And it's pretty much the same if you collect these guys from uh, magnetic fields, you will end up with these equations. Then you write down these equations in a matrix form. Uh, and the trick here is to translate field from one layer to another layer. Uh, to do so, you need to divide by either this matrix or this matrix, depending on which layer you would like to translate. Uh, for example, if you would like to translate from second layer to the first layer, you divide by this matrix. And you know a priori that uh, this matrix is always invertible because is the determinant is always non-zero because uh, J and H Bessel functions are linearly independent. So in compact form, you end up with this expression 
and uh, which relates uh, fields expansion coefficients from either boundary uh, from two to one and from one to two, uh, lowering and raising matrices. Uh, explicitly given like this uh, for each boundary, for every boundary between any layers, uh, apparently adjacent layers. Uh, and then we introduce uh, composite transfer matrices, which are raising or lowering. Uh, the most interesting is raising matrix, because effectively, if you translate fields from the core to the uh, surrounding medium, uh, your problem reduces from the multilayered sphere to homogeneous sphere. Uh, then uh, you put boundary conditions because there are too much unknowns here. Uh, each uh, for each boundary, you end up with not so many equations as you would like to have. And you need to set with the boundary conditions. So the re regularity boundary condition uh, limits the outgoing field uh, from the sphere core. And this very regularity condition uh, helps you to find the uh, ratio of the expansion coefficients in the host, which you basically correspond to the me coefficients from the books, from the previous lecture, uh, very much commonly uh, used. And the second boundary condition yields, uh, well, not really yields, but comes from the source. And it depends on the uh, any particular problem you are considering. Uh, whether the source is outside of the sphere, is it plane wave, or dipole source, or Gauss illumination, or whatever. Or source can be inside a sphere. Then, very much simply, uh, the uh, outside of the sphere, uh, there is no electric fields. There is no source incoming to your sphere. A corresponds to amplitude of the incoming field. Then uh, it is very much interesting to uh, introduce T matrix, S matrix, which correspond to the scattering theory. And here I would like to relate uh, to refer to classic uh, books, probably it will be in Jackson. Uh, classic electrodynamics or Newton scattering theory for Newton. Uh, and uh, I've seen that there is a question about the, again, to explain T matrices and S matrices. So T matrix, again, uh, it relates the incident field uh, to the outgoing field, while S matrix field uh, relates the incoming field to the outgoing field. So the difference between incident and incoming field is that incoming field has both in, uh, sorry. Uh, so again, incident field has incoming and outgoing component, while incoming field is only incoming. And that is the difference between T matrix and S matrix. So T matrix give you, provides you the relation to the, the whole incident field and the field scattered. Uh, well, S matrix uh, considers only incident component, only incoming component. Uh, and your field, your wave, can be written uh, in the following manner in spherical coordinates. Uh, which upon recalling the definition of Hankel function uh, plus and minus introduced here, uh, you can uh, safely end up uh, with the following expression, which relates the S matrix and T matrix. So the whole point of introducing of S matrix is uh, it helps to understand the scheduling processes because it can be factorized into the uh, eigenfrequencies, zeros and poles. And the question was uh, in the discussion that, uh, yes, something about uh, da, 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 da. why is just for factorization for T matrix? No. So only S matrix can be factorized like this. <clears throat> uh, yeah. 
because because of this relation. So uh, you will have uh, one. Yeah, you you could actually write down something much much less similar to this factorization to T matrix, but it will not be strictly proportional to the product. You will have uh, additional unity which a little bit complicates the analysis. So it's way much easier to do it in this way. So all of your zeros and poles will be symmetric to the real axis. Uh, yeah, and the whole point of introducing all these three T matrices, S matrices, is to understand the fundamental cross sections pretty much straightforwardly to understand the uh, far fields uh, scattering patterns. Again, very much straightforward. Uh, and that's it. So let me briefly check. Okay, slide 23. Uh, the regularity condition, what if a wave comes into the sphere can it not translate through the origin and reach the opposite side of the sphere to also create an outgoing wave? So, uh, formally, yes, uh, but uh, we, so the whole point of our problem, the whole point of our problem, we treat it in spherical coordinates which means that that is the origin of our coordinates. This is the zero. And if, fields, uh, if field is coming, so essentially you end up with uh, considering uh, this line, this whole, this line, there is nothing on the left. There is zero. Uh, this is the uh, origin of our coordinates. And if you have the fields uh, going from outside, uh, it will reflect here, re reflect from here, propagate here, reflect, propagate, reflect, propagate. And here in the core, it will reflect back, propagate to the core, and that's it. And in the zero, it's just the end. That's it. So from a mathematical point of view, this is like this. It, it, it works like this. So it just ends at the zero and doesn't create any outgoing fields because this is the origin of coordinates here. Oh. Yeah, and actually uh, about universality, 1D, 2D, 3D, we always consider one dimensional propagation. Well, formally, yes, that is, uh, uh, upon uh, introducing the appropriate uh, decom decomposition of the fields in one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional system, uh, you always inevitably end up with uh, this very much simple one dimensional uh, problem. And I believe, yeah, so that is pretty much briefly a uh, brief attempt to summarize and a little bit elaborate and explain uh, on previous part of the lecture. Uh, so let me continue. So uh, we have considered the, uh, the whole concept of the recursive transfer matrix method. Uh, we have cons uh, and we end up with the conclusion that uh, we need to introduce some boundary conditions. One boundary condition was uh, is uh, to uh, eliminate the outgoing fields uh, from the sphere core, uh, and the second boundary condition uh, is in uh, inevitably relates uh, to the source. Uh, and here we will consider two different sources. First of all, uh, plane wave illumination, uh, very much simple and uh, common, uh, and you have considered uh, this in the previous lecture. Uh, and a little bit uh, more sophisticated dipole source. So let me start uh, with the uh, plane wave illumination. So 
uh, again, uh, very much, uh, very much uh, familiar expressions. Well, though uh, a little uh, rolled down in a little bit different manner again. So uh, plane wave can be decomposed into a spherical harmonics in the following manner. Uh, and for a linearly polarized wave, uh, you end up uh, with a very much closed form and simple expressions. Uh, and essentially, it, it means that we are done here. So anything related to the plane wave illumination can be found. We know the expansion coefficients for the plane wave from the outside, they're given like this. We know that we have regularity condition at the sphere core. Uh, we know how to relate fields, how to translate field uh, from one layer to another. And so we can at least to the very beginning, uh, we can find, for example, a uh, near field distribution uh, for a multi-layered sphere. Uh, it's a little bit uh, small font here, sorry about that. Uh, on the top, you see the electric fields um, for uh, different configurations uh, of spheres. Uh, that is uh, the uh, different combination of uh, silicon core and uh, gold shells. And uh, here, uh, there is magnetic fields, which corresponds to uh, any given uh, configuration. And this is it. Uh, you have a plane wave. You can translate, uh, you, you know the configuration of your sphere. Uh, and you can uh, easily translate a field from uh, one uh, layer to another to find any field within any region. So uh, for the reference, uh, I can say that uh, all of these figures have been uh, pretty much exactly reproduced from reference 41. Uh, and um, very shortly <laughs> during the practice, you will do very much the same using my code and obtain uh, very much the same picture. So. <clears throat> Uh, but, uh, and it feels like uh, we could uh, essentially end up with discussing the plane wave illumination because uh, we can find everything so far for a plane wave illumination. Uh, we can find fundamental cross section, scattering cross section, absorption cross section, extinction cross section, near field, uh, Jones matrix, how the uh, Angle, depend, angle resolved scattering for your multilayered sphere. Uh, but what is interesting here is uh, uh, to calculate uh, the energy, electromagnetic energy uh, stored uh, in a multilayered sphere. Uh, it's sort of important for uh, a number of uh, applications. Uh, and I'm not going to provide you uh, a very detailed uh, derivation of uh, this quantity, uh, but I will try to briefly discuss it. So um, the energy, uh, the electromagnetic energy stored uh, in the uh, multi-relay sphere is nothing but the sum of uh, energies stored in any layer. Uh, and the total energy stored uh, in each layer uh, is nothing but the integral within this given layer, uh, the integral of the electromagnetic energy density of this shell. And this density is nothing but the uh, integral over the four pi of the whole uh, 
different directions of the solid angle. So the trick here is that uh, all of these energies are interested, interesting uh, for practical applications, but not so much as the this quantity, which essentially provides you uh, the averaged field distribution at a given uh, radius within, again, any layer, inside a sphere, outside a sphere, everywhere. And this averaged uh, electric field enhancement squared uh, is pretty much vital for uh, characterizing a number of different phenomena uh, like surface enhanced Raman uh, Raman spectroscopy uh, for nonlinear processes and uh, so on so forth and Okay, sorry about that. So, and the usual procedure to find these uh, averaged electromagnetic fields is to use brute force, brute force simulations to find the overall pattern of the electromagnetic field, and then to fix uh, some distance, and for each point to uh, collect all of these uh, different values of the fields and find the average. That is how it is usually done numerically. So again, you find fields explicitly, you choose the radio, uh, you choose some distance of interest and you find the average. So essentially uh, on using uh, the transfer matrix formalism, and again, I'm not going to spend so much time on drawing these equations. Uh, you can find the analytical solution to this problem. And it's very much complicated. Uh, and if you would like to uh, read about this, uh, here I refer to some references. So the whole point, again, uh, to get the uh, averaged field within the solid uh, within the solid solid angle and after doing some algebra after doing some derivations uh, you end up with these equations uh, which are again goes down to familiar uh, composite transfer matrices And again, uh, the, the whole idea here is that uh, once you have your transfer matrix, once you find uh, all of these, all of your transfer matrices uh, for your uh, multilayered sphere, you can end up with a, a number of different analytical uh, tricks, solutions, and results. Um, I'm going to uh, discuss this uh, averaged fields a little bit later also as well. So moving on. Uh, also uh, by after doing again some algebra, uh, you can find the uh, total energy stored within your multilayered sphere. So that's a very brief summary for this uh, plane wave excitation uh, discussion. So again, if you know your transfer matrix, you can get pretty much everything. Far field patterns, near field, uh, fundamental cross sections, electromagnetic energy, electromagnetic energy density. Once you find this matrix, uh, you do some post-processing of this transfer matrix and you can uh, find a lot of stuff here. 
you can get uh, a lot of properties after doing some manipulations with uh, transfer metrics. So uh, dipole source, uh, dipole emitter uh, is a little bit more involved. So uh, to what cases or to what uh, problems it is applicable? Uh, if you deal with uh, some very small quantum dots, inorganic quantum dots, if you deal with dyes, if you deal with uh, fluorophores, organic molecules, uh, which sizes uh, are way much smaller than the total radius of a multilayered sphere, uh, then you can treat these uh, things, this stuff, as a dipole emitter. Uh, with the dipole, uh, and now uh, the dipole emitter, uh, in the general case of multilayered sphere, can be located in any layer, uh, outside of the sphere, inside the sphere, in the core, uh, anywhere. Uh, and the problem with the uh, dipole emitter is that uh, it emits uh, light in all directions. So like in uh, all the whole uh, solid angle, uh, which makes this a uh, problem for uh, solving the uh, light scattering from the multilayered sphere with this source uh, a little bit more involved. So here's the thing. Uh, it is very much uh, we should um, it's very much important to distinguish, um, well, not really to distinguish, to consider the uh, general uh, generic shell. So there is something outside, something inside, so we have a shell. Uh, and when dapple emits within any given shell, uh, it emits uh, to the origin of the coordinate system of the, to the origin of the sphere, and it also emits to the uh, far zone, to the outgoing field. Uh, and when we solve this problem uh, for dipole source, uh, we need really to distinguish uh, which boundary are we considering. Is it boundary uh, located? to the left of your source, to the right of your source. And then uh, the electric field, the magnetic field, uh, created by these dipoles can be written as follows. So if the observation point is located close to the origin, then uh, we decompose our fields to the ingoing wave, waves. And uh, these are expansion coefficient for the double source in this case. If the observation point is located far further from the uh, source oh, to the right of the source further from the uh, origin then we decompose our fields to the ongoing outgoing fields and that's how the uh, uh, again the expansion uh, coefficients for the dipole source are look like uh, it's kind of very simple and uh, trivial explanation. Uh, again, if you would like to dig into more details, uh, I would like to refer to this uh, pretty much classic uh, literature dated back like 
40 years ago. But uh, from the very naive and simple uh, understanding, again, uh, if your observation point located to the left of your source, close to the uh, origin, you decompose to the ingoing waves. And uh, I, decom uh, I use these expansion coefficients to the left. Uh, and if your observation point is located to the right of your source, uh, then I decompose the field at this point uh, by outgoing wave in, on the outgoing uh, waves basis and uh, using expansion coefficients to the right. Um, I'm going to stop for a moment and do we have any questions? Okay, so far so good. So, as long as we know the, uh, as long as we construct it in the general case, uh, the fields uh, created by the source. So we essentially, uh, like we know the source, we know the source right now. We again need to uh, double check with uh, boundary conditions. So again, regularity condition applies here, but if the dipole is not located in the core. So right now, uh, <laughs> as long as we have a dipole, dipole, a dipole emitter, it can be located anywhere in the sphere, including the core. So if that is located in the core, well, uh, we'll deal with this. If it is not located in the core, the regularity condition looks like this. Again, similar, there is no outgoing wave from the core. So, and for the expansion coefficients outside of the sphere, uh, it is again very much straightforward. If dipole located inside the sphere, there is no source outside. If dipole located outside of the sphere, uh, okay, we have these expansion coefficients this expansion coefficient to the dipole emitter, where the observation points located close to the origin. Okay. So <clears throat> expansion coefficients, when you try to translate fields uh, from one layer to another, uh, become a little bit more involved because, well, in general case, uh, dipole can be located anywhere. And uh, these expansion coefficients may occasionally uh, include the expansion coefficient for a dipole if the corresponding layer contains the dipole emitter. So, uh, so far, uh, we just move on and uh, solve this problem in general. Generally, uh, for dipole located anywhere. And our task will be to find the field outside. So to find the outgoing expansion coefficient in the uh, host medium. Uh, so the purpose, yeah, so the, the point of this task is that uh, for problems containing dipole meters, uh, we uh, very much interested, usually very much interested in the uh, uh, outgoing waves outside of the sphere. So for, again, for generic shell, uh, boundary conditions can be written in the following manner. So just a shell, just nth shell, left boundary, right boundary. So on the left boundary, uh, I'm using uh, 
Ah, and there is only one dipole source here. So on the left boundary, I translate field from the core to this boundary. And that is our, uh, that's how I translate field from the core to this boundary. Again, regularity condition, which sets uh, B1 to zero. There, is, there are no outgoing waves from the core. And I know that uh, the dipole source is not in the core because it is in the generic shell. And I translate the uh, field from the core on using composite transfer matrix forward to here. So that's how fields, field, fields are translated from the core to this left boundary of the generic shell. Uh, if I would like to translate the fields field uh, from this shell okay, to this boundary, um, it's pretty much straightforward. Uh, I'm using the uh, expansion coefficients of the fields, whatever come to this shell, plus dipole source here. Okay, so that's how it looks for this boundary. For the right boundary, for the right boundary, again, uh, the dipole translates. like this. So I'm using the uh, fields, whatever, whatever are they uh, in this shell, A and B, plus outgoing fields, outgoing, so this is the second row, it corresponds to outgoing fields, outgoing fields of the dipole source. That's how it translates from this shell to this boundary. And from outside, from outside, where, whatever is located uh, on the outside, uh, everything is translated like this. I'm using the uh, uh, lower, lowering downward matrix. Uh, so in the host, there is no source in the host. So there is no incoming field in the, in the host. So that's, this coefficient is zero. Uh, and uh, there is some outgoing field, this coefficient D. So for any generic shell, uh, not host, not, uh, not shell, uh, not core, uh, the boundary conditions uh, can be written as follows. If you walk around a little bit on this, uh, you can find uh, D in an explicit manner. Uh, and this expression can be uh, can be more or less intuitively understood. That uh, that corresponds to the uh, this guy, this corresponds to this guy, and they somehow related to each other. And uh, that will uh, emitter interacted with uh, both of these boundaries and translated the field to outside of the sphere. So. Essentially, uh, there are two, uh, well, basically three uh, specific cases to consider. Uh, one is uh, if the dipole located outside of the sphere and the observation point is here, dipole located outside of the sphere and the observation point is here, and the dipole located in the core. So. Essentially, if you consider the host medium, the host, the host medium, uh, you end up considering only this boundary. And setting up uh, and considering uh, this um, boundary condition. But the point here is that this zero becomes this guy because uh, in the host medium, I have a source and you're done. 
on this you can find the uh, observation point here. Uh, for this situation, it's pretty much the same, but for these points, uh, the fields will be created not only by sphere, like this, but the field will be mediated by the dipole itself. Uh, and another specific case is that uh, you have a core, you have a dipole located in the core, uh, and again explicitly, we end up with uh, considering this boundary. Oh, I see. Okay, uh, and. If dipole located in the core, then you set up this zero to be this guy. And that's it. And you're done with B. So basically, uh, we have considered it, uh, four different examples on how to find the expansion coefficient D outside of the sphere for dipole located at any point, at any shell, including uh, specific scenarios. And if we know this uh, expansion coefficient D, we can build up the fields outside of the sphere. And that is very much interesting for light scattering community because then uh, you can build up far field scatter for distances uh, large enough from the sphere to build up different characteristics, uh, which I will consider uh, on the next slide. So again, if I build up the fields outside from the sphere for known Ds, I know Ds, uh, for any case, uh, irrespective of where the dipole is located. Uh, I can then uh, go to the far fields by setting up the observation point to infinity. I can use the uh, limiting, uh, limiting expression uh, expressions for Hankel, fun Hankel function, H. Remember, the multiple decomposition, uh, H, uh, it has consists of uh, Hankel function H. Uh, in the limit of the infinity, I can find the limiting expressions for Hankel function and derivative of the Hankel function. Uh, then uh, approx find approximate solutions uh, for these multiples. If I replace this H by these expressions, and derivatives by these expressions. I can uh, replace these H's in the fields uh, and end up with uh, very much uh, important uh, relation to the far fields, to the field in the far zone. Which is again, again and again, uh, can be built up from the coefficient D, expansion coefficient D, which is again uh, dependent on the uh, transfer matrix. Let me start for a moment. Uh, do we have questions? I guess there are no new questions in the chat. No, no questions. So it looks like it might be way too much complicated. <laughs> Everyone is lost. Uh, or everybody is also okay. Okay, let's let's move on. So uh, essentially, uh, right now, uh, yeah, I'm running a little bit short of time. I have uh, well a lot of information uh, to discuss. So <clears throat> I will just a little bit speed up. So uh, if you know the fields in the far zone, uh, you know electric field, you know magnetic fields, you can build up them. Uh, you can uh, pretty much easily uh, calculate the pointing vector, which represents the uh, uh, 
the energy flow, the power, the power, radiated power, uh, radiated by your dipole emitter in the presence of the multi-layered sphere. Uh, get the pointing vector uh, on using the non relations. I know E and H. I know E and H pretty much easily. Uh, I can substitute these E and H's uh, to the uh, from the from the previous slides. Come on, uh, from the previous slide, I can substitute this E and H to the pointing vector, and the basically the angular distribution of the radiated power, and end up with two important equations. One of which uh, is the total radiated power, which is again dependent on the expansion coefficients d, and the angular distribution of the radiated power, which is again uh, is a function of d. Uh, if I divide one by another, and also normalize uh, this total radiated power to the uh, the whole solid angle for pi, I will get the directivity, the directivity of the antenna, uh, which is uh, more or less useful for antenna community, apparently. Uh, now uh, it's a little bit of uh, normalization. Uh, so, it's kind of uh, going back and uh, very much briefly uh, to recall uh, how the total radiated power of the dipole is calculated. So, it can be calculated uh, by using all of these expressions. Um, for a dipole source, it ends up with this if the dipole source is located in the vacuum, and if dipole source is located in some dielectric host, uh, it will be like this. So it is instructive to get these uh, quantities uh, for the radiated power of the dipole, because next uh, uh, we can come up to the, uh, again, very much important uh, expressions for radiative decay rates for a dipole emitter in the presence of the um, uh, multi-layered sphere. Uh, and they are calculated as the power radiated by a dipole uh, in the presence of the multi-layered sphere divided by the uh, power radiated uh, by the dipole emitter without any sphere. So this is the normalization constant will be from this slide. And uh, radiated power according to these expressions. So essentially, again, uh, depending on uh, where the dipole is located, uh, you simply use uh, the appropriate expansion coefficients, the appropriate combination of expansion coefficients, and the appropriate uh, outgoing or uh, ingoing or outgoing uh, spherical waves, and can build up a self-consistent solution for this system. And again, it's, uh, it becomes pretty much compact and pretty much straightforward uh, on using transfer matrices. Here, uh, it is uh, important to distinguish uh, different cases where the uh, dipole is located. Inside the core, uh, in the generic shell, or outside of the core, uh, outside of the sphere. So if the dipole located inside the core it will be only outgoing wave from here. Um, so now it's 
well, okay, it, it will require a little bit uh, more explanation. I'm just gonna uh, leave it for a discussion. And <clears throat> dissipated power. So uh, it is also important to uh, understand uh, how much of the energy is stored within uh, the uh, multilayered sphere, how much energy is absorbed by sphere uh, and, uh, well, in the presence of the dipolometer. Uh, and again, after doing some algebra, well, basically a lot of algebra, uh, you can uh, end up with uh, self-consistent solution, which is generally uh, written down like this. Again, non-radiative power is uh, the power, uh, the energy absorbed by a sphere. Uh, and this energy comes from the dipole emitter. Uh, in general, it uh, depends on uh, how the uh, dipole emitter is located uh, with respect uh, to the absorbing shell. Absorbing shell uh, is the shell uh, with the imaginary part of the dielectric primitivity larger than zero. Then the material is absorbing. Uh, and the respective uh, position between dipole and shells are, can be summarized in uh, uh, four different scenarios. The dipole is in the core, the dipole uh, is uh, closer to the origin of the sphere rather than uh, absorbing shell, vice versa, and dipole is outside of the sphere. And again, every solution, uh, uh, the solution can be written in terms of a uh, combination, appropriate combination of the transfer matrices. Forward or backward transfer matrices. I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Uh, and so I'm gonna skip this slide. So just uh, to give you a sense why uh, the uh, decay rates uh, are so important. Uh, the uh, radiative and non-radiative decay rates are used uh, for fluorescence. Uh, and here is just the example uh, from uh, these references uh, for uh, decay rates uh, of the uh, generic uh, multilayered sphere, uh, gold shells and um, silicon uh, dielectrics, uh, silicon dielectric shells, um, and decay rates for uh, different uh, particles, ABCD, different combinations, uh, small, medium, and large one, uh, and for pure silica, for pure gold, and whatever. So the, the point here is that uh, Let's track, uh, for example, uh, radiative and non-radiative decay rates uh, going from sphere core, which is the electric here, uh, to the metallic shell, which is like blank space here. So the trick here is that uh, this, this space is blank because uh, the formalism does not allow to uh, solve the problem if the dipole emitter is located within the absorbing shell, then the uh, energy is well, just simply will be absorbed uh, by uh, the this absorbing shell, and uh, no energy will just decay, go to the radiative or non radiative channels. So, if you track this uh, decay rates, you see that uh, once you approach the uh, metallic shells it just uh, very much absorb the energy, uh, which means that the non-radiative decay rates uh, increases uh, pretty much dramatically. Okay, so just to sum up the uh, dipole emitter uh, case, uh, dipole emitter source. <clears throat> uh, 
Again, if you know the, uh, where the dapple emitter is located within your multilayered sphere, uh, and if you know the uh, overall configuration of your sphere, uh, you can find the expansion coefficients within uh, any layer. From these expansion coefficients, you can get the electromagnetic fields and you translate the electromagnetic fields from one layer to another. Uh, by knowing these fields, you can get the pointing vector. And from this pointing vector, you can calculate the radiated power uh, in the far zone, or basically in, 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 in each zone, but, but more interesting in the far zone. You can find the dissipated power, the energy which is absorbed by the uh, multilayered sphere. Uh, by knowing the far field radiating, uh, uh, radiative patterns, you can find out the directivity uh, of this dipole emitter. And uh, from all of this stuff, you can get the uh, DK rates, non-radiative and radiative. Uh, I'm going to talk about these uh, really uh, spontaneous decay rates uh, a bit later, uh, just to elaborate on these guys a bit more. So let me check questions. Forty-six. Okay. So, uh, what does the sum over uh, imaginary epsilon mean? So the sum here implies that uh, I summarize uh, this expression for every absorbing shell. Because uh, in general, uh, I can deal with, uh, well, there is a multi this is a multilayered sphere, and the number of absorbing shells, the shells with imaginary parts of the epsilon larger than zero. So the number of these shells can be arbitrarily large. It can be one, two, three, four absorbing layers. And I summarize this expression for all of the absorbing layers. So, excuse me. So when the imaginary part is less than zero, then it means that we have a meeting layer? And we uh, so if imaginary past less than zero uh, might be a little bit more uh, tricky and requires. Uh, so yeah, it, it corresponds to the uh, active layer. And I would deal with this problem with a very more, very much carefully. So, uh, but it is, it is not absorbing. It is not absorbing. So I don't need to calculate non-radiative decay rates here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have another question. Uh, so you used the uh, expression for the energy, electromagnetic energy density, and uh, it consists of two terms, uh, the square of electric and square of magnetic fields. And you had some prefactors of them. Uh, oh, yeah. So. So it's, uh, is it brilliant formula? Uh, yes, yes, exactly. So, so it does consider the um, dispersion of the, of the permittivity. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. So do we have more questions? 41, slide 41. So I do have a question. So if R less than R D, uh, it is already here. So uh, yeah. So uh, we don't need to. So look, uh, this term is already uh, calculated, uh, took into account the presence of the sphere. 
So it goes here, it goes to the sphere and bounces back. And all of this interaction is already built in here. And again, this boundary, this boundary uh, implies that we have fields coming up here. And this is it. So to put it a little bit simply, it is just built in here. While in this case, in this case, I need to include this term, this expansion coefficient, because uh, I have a field reflected from the sphere and coming from the dipole, the two different fields. While here, at this point, I have uh, the fields only coming from the dipole and reflected from here and reflected, so they're just already calculated here. Something like this. Okay, so. Uh, okay, we have uh, half an hour, I believe so. Uh, I'll try to summarize all of the stuff. And uh, right now I would like to discuss a little bit of more numerical aspects and introduce more physics and uh, very briefly discuss uh, applications where uh, all of these multilayer spheres can be used and how the quantities uh, introduced in our lectures can be used uh, for these different applications. So first of all, uh, very much crucial po points uh, is um, to define uh, where is our convergence for all of our methods of all of all of our summations. Because in all of the equations, uh, let me go here. Uh, I am summarizing because uh, I'm summarizing a different number of multiples. And usually uh, it, is, uh, it comes from the dipole, L equals one, to the infinity. Well, usually you may find uh, this expression uh, in the uh, papers, books, whatever. But the trick here, if you would like to implement this numerically, you have to stop somewhere. You cannot uh, summarize uh, to the infinity, uh, to the infinite number of multiples. Uh, you should set up the limits of your summation. Uh, and it is easy if you uh, would like to, you know, consider the uh, only double contribution, only quadruple con contribution, uh, octuple or whatever. But if you would like to uh, have the self-consistent picture, for example, uh, if you consider plane wave illumination uh, and uh, would like to get uh, cross sections like absorption, scattering, or extinction, uh, you can safely uh, set up the maximum uh, momentum, angular momentum number, uh, maximum multiple, uh, which are found as follows, where x is the size parameter. Uh, size parameter, which is the product of the uh, wave number in the host medium, multiplied by the uh, outer radius of your multilayer sphere, so the the larger one radius of the outer layer. Uh, and yeah, pretty much it. Uh, it depends on on your size parameter, uh, and you set up these uh, multiples. And you find uh, self-consistent and uh, safely exact solution for the far field. If you consider near field distribution uh, in the near field zone, uh, this uh, criterion is a little bit different. Uh, for derivations, uh, for uh, benchmarking, and for comparison, I would like to, uh, to refer to these papers uh, of all of these criteria. 
for the dipole source, uh, if you are working on uh, the radi radiative decay rates, which are uh, calculated for far zone, uh, essentially you can use uh, very same criteria. For non-radiative decay rates, uh, the problem is that you're working in the near field region. And uh, in the near field region for the dipole emitter, you can effectively uh, induce uh, the arbitrary large number of multiples. And strictly speaking, there is no guideline here uh, to, for the cutoff, for the cutoff here. So for non-radiative key rates, um, it is more suitable to set up the accuracy of your calculations uh, rather than uh, setting up the maximum amount of the uh, multiples considered. So one more aspect here is that if you would like to implement all of these Bessel functions numerically, uh, by your hands uh, on using the definitions of the Bessel and Hankel functions like from sinus and sinus and cos cosinus, uh, you usually end up with uh, a lot of problems with overflows, uh, with uh, losing the uh, accuracy due to the machine precision. And uh, it is kind of a well-known trick again, uh, consider it in these references and derived in these references and compared in these references, uh, to consider not the uh, simply Bessel functions, but their derivatives. Uh, and on using uh, these definitions, uh, you can use recurrence relation to generate, uh, so uh, any L minus one multiple for any given L multiple. Uh, and you can use, so D is the uh, logarithmic derivative <coughs> of your Bessel function. Uh, and well, basically uh, you can also generate the product of the your Bessel functions uh, and find out the uh, this derivative. So as a starting point, you can use uh, for zeroth multiple, which is actually not, not used in the calculations. We start with the one, which is, which is great, with the first multiple, which is a dipole, which is great. Uh, we can use these uh, initial values, use these uh, recurrence relations, and generate the products of the, of the Bessel functions or the logarithmic derivatives of the uh, Bessel functions, which are then uh, used in the transfer matrices um, and in uh, expansion coefficients uh, and get more stable results. Uh, again, uh, if, you would, if that is interesting, uh, see these references. Uh, the trick here is that, for example, in, in MATLAB, uh, the Bessel functions are pretty good, uh, generated on using uh, very good machine accuracy and using all of these tricks. But for example, if you would like to use it in Fortran, uh, or I'm not sure about Python, uh, you will likely uh, end up with uh, these expressions. Ooh. So uh, one more aspect. So if you deal with uh, very thin metallic shells, uh, it is very much important to consider the uh, scattering, uh, the finite size effects. So consider the following. Uh, consider the metal, uh, bulk sample of the metal, for example, gold, silver or something else uh, and uh, consider the uh, propagation of the electrons in this medium. So 
the electrons, uh, uh, so the propagation of the electron uh, is characterized by the three path, three path, uh, which is uh, nothing but the uh, distance which is traveled by the electron between two collisions. For example, for gold, it is about 52 nanometers. Now, consider the following. If you have multilayered sphere and the, sh the thickness of the shell is smaller than the electron three path, uh, electron three path length in the bulk medium, the electron will additionally have uh, some dissipation from the boundaries of your shell, which is uh, which has to be considered and which basically uh, modifies the bulk electric primitivity used in your calculations by the following. So here uh, corrected primitivity. Here's the bulk primitivity, which you use for a bulk sample. And here's the correction. So uh, here, omega p is the plasma frequency. I don't know, did you consider the uh, plas plasmonic effects or not? If not, just uh, refer to this reference and uh, look to this paper for more details. Uh, I'm just going to briefly explain that omega p is the plasma frequency. Omega d is the uh, drew the damping constant. And omega is just the frequency. Uh, and that's it. So gamma is given like this. Here v is the Fermi velocity. Uh, and the effective path, which is traveled by the electrons, are given like this. So here uh, is the Rn is the outer radius of your sphere, Rn minus 1 is the uh, inner radius of your sphere. And the point here is that uh, if your effective path will be large enough, will be very large, this term will vanish, gamma become gamma d, then these two terms will be the same, and epsilon will become like epsilon bulk. So for sufficiently thick shells, you don't care about this correction. But uh, as your shell becomes thinner and thinner and smaller and smaller, for example, for golds uh, like five nanometers, 10 nanometers, all of these additional scattering effects uh, will play significant role and will significantly modify the overall response of your multilayered sphere. It is, well, in my opinion, it is very crucial and important to understand this because uh, usually for very thin shells, uh, people use uh, like bulk dielectric primitivity and don't take into account uh, all of these corrections, which may very much significantly uh, affect and change the final results. Uh, and again, uh, all of this stuff will be considered in our practice. Uh, finally, we have 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, so, we have considered a lot of stuff about multilayered spheres. Well, probably not very much, uh, maybe clearly, uh, maybe uh, not so rigorously. Uh, again, I would like to refer to some papers uh, mentioned on every slide to get more details and more explanations. But the point is that uh, if we know the transfer matrices uh, for our multilayered spheres, uh, we can get a lot of information. For example, uh, electric field distribution, as I have shown you before for a plane wave illumination. And this electric field distribution is very much important for, uh, for example, for surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. 
where multilateral spheres can be used uh, as the uh, well the tag to detect some molecules analytes and these multilateral spheres uh, can be linked to some molecules and inside this multilateral sphere uh, it can be constructed with the uh, different combination of metal and dielectric. And inside this dielectric, the Raman molecules can be embedded. And the trick is the following. If you put, uh, so if you construct this reporter probe, uh, and if that probe uh, will connect to a specific molecule, specific biology you would like to Im imagine, uh, you would like to have the image, you just put the light, excite these uh, nanoparticles, and at some wavelengths, uh, if you create very high uh, energy, uh, ele electric energy enhancement, you will enhance these reporters, Raman reporters, and get the signal out and uh, get the uh, image of your system. And for the Raman reporters, it is very much important to get the uh, electric fields enhancements. And the overall uh, performance of these reporters reporters depends only on the electric field enhancement into the fourth power. So if you know these electric fields, you can calculate all of this stuff and you can immediately uh, understand how is suitable your uh, particle to Raman spectroscopy. Here, uh, these uh, kind of systems uh, have been proposed roughly 10 years ago. Very much interesting. So, also uh, by multilayer multi spheres, you can uh, engineer the absorption. So, for example, uh, if uh, multilayer spheres can be used uh, to destroy cancer cells in biology and medicine and their performance uh, depends on how much energy they absorb. If they absorb a lot of energy, they will be heated, and the heat dissipation, uh, the, the heating particle, uh, will destroy, for example, a uh, cancer cell. Or another application is uh, absorption of light can be used for solar cells. And again, uh, we know how to characterize the uh, multilayered sphere. Uh, again, I'm recalling the uh, absorption cross section here. Uh, and here again, re remember uh, the S matrix. And the absorption is nothing but uh, so anything but the outgoing wave. From understanding this uh, expression, you can design the uh, particles to absorb a lot of energy. And you can see that the maximum absorption, the maximum uh, uh, can, is possible if scattering matrix is zero. And it's natural. If particle does not scatter anything, it will absorb. And for any given channel, uh, for any given channel, uh, the maximum absorption is given like this. If you set up S to zero. Okay. And again, refer to these papers and you can see that uh, the absorption can be uh, designed to get maximum values. These are pictures only for homogeneous particles. It's not so interesting. So you can have, well, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. It's really great. It's basically a great paper. Uh, but um, for a single channel, uh, it is very uh, complicated to 
well, it is impossible to overcome this limit. Oh. And interesting thing for multi-layer spheres is that uh, if you have a lot of layers, you can uh, excite different modes which correspond to different layers. So the resonances excited in different layers. Uh, here A and B are familiar mean coefficients here. Here's the plot is the uh, different radiuses, uh, different outer radiuses of this multilayer sphere. But the whole point here is that um, by appropriately uh, tuning uh, each channel, for example, electric dipole channel and magnetic dipole channel here, black and red here, uh, or including uh, electric and magnetic uh, quadrupoles, uh, you can sum up different channels and overcome the limit. This is the limit for a single channel, single dipole channel, or single quadrupole channel. You can overcome these limits and uh, by using different channels, by uh, using the interfere, uh, the uh, superposition of different channels, how the particle absorb, uh, you can design super absorption particles. It's very much interesting. <clears throat> so also uh, core shell particles uh, are used to design the nano-sized lasers. Uh, the approach is the following. So uh, it basically has, has been proposed probably 17 years ago, maybe almost 20 years ago. Uh, you use the core, uh, which is constructed, uh, which is uh, from optically active medium with the gain. Uh, for the gain, the refractive index, uh, I have negative imaginary part, negative. This is the gain. For loss, I have positive. <laughs> I know, I, have an, uh, I see your face. <laughs> Are you confused? <laughs> okay, whatever. No, no, uh, I'm just, uh, actually I have a question on the, on the previous slide. So here you said that this dashed line, this is the limit, uh, the maximum absorption limit, right? Yeah. Uh, but looking at the formula, I have sigma absorption and it, and it does not depend on the particle radius. So it should be so something like the constant. Uh, well, I now I have this confusion as well. It's not my paper, so let me see. Likely, likely, uh, you know what? Uh, all of this curve correspond to different wavelengths. Very likely. Mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, I would say that I would refer to this uh, thirty seven or thirty six uh, reference and see for more details. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it's, 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 not, it's not really clear from, from just, just the plot. Yeah, so basically that is, yeah, that is your limit. For each contribution, that is your limit. For each contribution. Mm -hmm. That is, yeah, good point. <laughs> so for the lasing, again, so going back to the lasers, uh, I'm constructing the core from the uh, optical active medium, the gain. And uh, shell is usually, uh, well, initially had been proposed to be the gold, uh, the gold one. So this plasmonic uh, nano, nano lasers, or basically it's phaser, surface plasmon amplification, and then like a laser. So in this case, uh, we are interested in the scattering, in the scattering cross section, <clears throat> uh, which is uh, given by, uh, this expression, uh, and again, sketching metrics. And our purpose is 
to maximize and to design the sketching matrix uh, to be as large as possible, to get the uh, a lot of uh, scattering uh, outside from our particle. And uh, for these systems with gain and loss, uh, it can be designed and, uh, for example, for different wavelengths, uh, for a given configuration of the given sizes of the particle, uh, for different gain, you can tune the gain, you can tune the wavelengths to get the uh, very much uh, narrow uh, peak the scattering cross uh, in the scattering cross section. So also uh, you may uh, it is very interesting to design the uh, scattering patterns, and uh, it has been already mentioned the uh, well-known, interesting, and famous Kerker effect, where uh, the <clears throat> back scattering is completely suppressed. Uh, here uh, I show the uh, setup uh, from one of these reference uh, for the homogeneous dielectric sphere. Uh, just just homogeneous for a start, uh, and at some wavelengths, uh, the back scattering can be uh, observed to be completely suppressed. So the general uh, requirements, general condition, for this uh, suppression of the back scattering looks like the following. And again, uh, knowing transfer matrices, knowing your permittivities, permeabilities, uh, you can design uh, your particle to suppress the back scattering. And which is actually uh, have been shown on the next slide. Again, I refer to a very neat and nice paper. I like it. Um, for by building core shells, and here the shell uh, will be like phase change material, uh, which uh, changes its phase from amorphous to crystalline uh, on using some external bias. Uh, you can design the uh, core shell nanoparticle. Uh, multilateral nanoparticle to suppress back scattering or suppress forward scattering. And all of this is possible uh, if you have multilateral spheres. So multilateral uh, spheres open up uh, new ways for new designs, new opportunities, new functionalities. Ooh, okay, uh, I'm running out of time. Uh, but uh, to finalize, uh, I would like to uh, briefly explain uh, the manipulation of the dipole emission uh, and on the example of the fluorescence. So uh, the very common example of the uh, dipole emitter, uh, dipole emission near multilateral sphere, uh, essentially, uh, well, practically, what is happening in practice, uh, it can be described by two different separate processes. So the first process is that you have a multilateral sphere. You put a dipole emitter here, whatever, dye, molecule, quantum dots, anything which emits light. And you excite all of your system with a plane wave. Then multilateral sphere uh, localizes the electric field near the dipole emitter. Uh, and then this dipole emitter radiates light. So you excite the whole system and you excite the sphere, creates the field and excite the dipole. And it happens on the excitation wavelength. Then you turn off the plane wave and you have only the dipole and it emits light. And essentially it emits light in three different channels. So just to remind you that it, it can go to non-radiative channel, which is absorbed by the particle. It goes to the radiative channel, uh, which you measure somewhere in the far field. And also, we didn't consider this uh, in all of our uh, theory. Uh, there is some intrinsic uh, transitions uh, within the <clears throat> dipole emitter. 
And all of this happens at the emission wavelengths, which is not necessarily the same as the excitation wavelengths. And it's usually called uh, reserve for the Stokes shift. So the excitation process can be described uh, by the, uh, this equation. So it's not, it is nothing but the uh, electric field enhancement. And P here is how many photons uh, are involved in this uh, process. So for example, if that is the simple floor of four, it's going to be just only one photon uh, absorbed uh, by the emitter. If you have up conversion or second harmonic uh, material, which just provides you second harmonic generation, uh, it will likely, uh, well not likely, but it actually eats two photons. Yeah, and the emission process uh, is, is described by the uh, quantum yield, which is nothing but the radiative power, which is radiative stuff, divided by all of these contributions from all of these channels. So it is essentially uh, the portion of, so how efficiently uh, this uh, emitter radi radiates light compared to all of the sum of all of the cha channels. And if you, for example, consider the fluorescence enhancements, uh, then the, it becomes very straightforward. You, first of all, you have the excitation enhancements, and then you have the emission enhancements. And that's it, you just multiply these two contributions. And the beauty of this approach is that uh, it is valid for, again, for fluorescence, for up conversion, for any um, fluor emitting dipoles, emitting processes. Uh, the only point is uh, correctly uh, and appropriately to describe the excitation rates. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip this, skip this, and summarize. <clears throat> so by using uh, transfer matrix formalism, uh, you can get complete light, sca light sketching picture you can get fundamental cross sections. You can get the near field distribution. You can feel the energy stored in the particle. You can feel, uh, find the far field scattering uh, processes. You can find the decay rate, spontaneous decay rates, directivity, much more. And essentially it uh, goes up to appropriately combining Bessel functions, uh, know, uh, knowing your boundary conditions, uh, and uh, doing some maybe post-processing of your uh, tra uh, transfer matrix, just some combinations for uh, any of these uh, problems and you're essentially done. And it is nothing scary about this. So uh, again, uh, what is really beautiful here is that uh, in any uh, scenario like one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional, you end up with one dimensional problem, even for three dimensional sphere, which is very uh, easily uh, and straightforwardly and clearly can be described by two by two metrics, transfer metrics. So even large object, uh, like three dimensional objects is very simple to describe by two by two transfer metrics. Um, and finally, what is, what is really important about all of this stuff, uh, if you would like to calculate all of these things, and if you use analytical solution, it is way, way much more faster than uh, if you use finite different time domain method, finite element methods, uh, boundary element methods. These are all good met methods, but they are numerical. Uh, and if you work with sphere and you work with multi-layered sphere, uh, it is way much better to use analytics, which speed up your calculations and which basically goes up to the next point, uh, next practical lesson.
So uh, just to conclude, uh, I'd like to provide some uh, references. You will be uh, given by this presentation, all the references are clickable. So uh, for me calculations, uh, it is uh, very much instructive and interesting to use uh, a website from it more, me calculator, uh, some other stuff. Uh, also, uh, if you would if you would be interested to find out some free uh, software for light scattering problems, I refer to these uh, two very nice uh, website websites. Uh, more info on light scattering problems and uh, multilayered spheres and other different problems and history of light scattering. Uh, can be found on the personal site of Alexander Moroz. He is the basically the principal investigator or advisor of this work uh, on the multilayered spheres. Uh, also interesting uh, channels can be found on YouTube. Mm, and if you will have any questions, uh, any suggestions, any mm, problems, you would like to collaborate, do some stuff together, please don't hesitate to uh, contact me. I'm always happy to work together to find new connections and to find new problems and be helpful. Okay, thank you very much. Just to remind you that multilayer spheres are important and can be used for different stuff. Thank you very much, Ilya, for the, the great two lectures. Uh, so uh, next we'll have lunch break or breakfast break. Uh, so just break uh, before the practical lessons. So the practical lessons will start at uh, 3.50, uh, the mm -hmm. most time. Uh, so don't forget to use uh, Zoom links, which are shared in the, the common chat. Uh, so also, uh, there was one question from the chat about the software for the practical lessons. So you, Ilya, you said that you're going to use the MATLAB code and... Uh... Uh, yes, so as far as I understand, uh, you have, uh, so all the participants uh, have the access to the uh, course sources. And uh, there is a folder uh, named either multilayered spheres or mm -hmm. Ilya Raskazov, not sure how it is. And that is the package, the package uh, written in MATLAB. Uh, you can download it from, the, from that link, which has been provided by the organizers. Uh, if you have your own MATLAB on your installed in your machine, uh, it's great, uh, free to use it. Uh, it is uh, this, code is valid uh, starting from MATLAB 2016A version. Uh, if you don't have uh, the MATLAB installed in your computer, you can use, as far as I understand, uh, the remote desktop uh, access provided uh, by, again, by the organizers to the uh, computer lab. Yes, 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 yes. Sort of, sort of like this. So, um, yep, that's it. So we are going to use method code. It is available. Uh, it's the question to the organizers how to download it, because uh, I I don't really know. <clears throat> I just send them the link, and this is it. Um, just download this package, and uh, during the practical lessons, I will explain how to deal with this and how to work with this, and we'll likely have some fun. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Any yeah. other questions? Uh, there were several questions uh, concerning the lecture. Probably you can bring hey, I, I likely, so let me start a uh, practical lesson with the answer to all of these questions and then we'll just go to them. Okay, great. Yeah, okay. That's it. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. See you soon, guys. See you.